Welcome back to Tightwad Workshop. So a few videos ago I recommended that you should buy one of these eBay bicycle repair toolkits to get yourself some tools to get started as a bicycle repairer. Now because I made that recommendation, it seems only fair that I should buy one of those toolkits for myself so that I can eat my own words if that turns out to be bad advice. We'll test these tools by using them to disassemble these four scrap bicycles. Now it's important to remember that these are not the highest quality tools. They're not going to last very long if you're using them eight hours a day, five days a week in a professional workshop. But they'll be enough to get you started at home. And as you wear things out, you can replace them with better quality if you decide you want to stick with bicycle repair. We'll start with this kid's BMX bike. It looks like it's been left out in the rain for a while. So our first tool from the toolkit is this pedal spanner. It has two different sizes at each end, and for this bike we'll need the 15mm slot. On the chainring side of the bike, the pedal uses a regular lefty loosey thread. Once you've loosened the pedal, you can usually finish removing it by hand. If you forget which direction you should turn it, the end of the pedal shaft is stamped with R for right-handed. The pedal on the opposite side of the bike uses a left-handed thread, so we'll need to turn it to righty removey. If it's rusty, you might need to apply a fair amount of force to crack the thread loose. As you can see, this pedal is marked L for left-handed. Now we'll select our small adjustable spanner from the toolkit. Then we'll use it to loosen the nuts on the front wheel. That's not working very well, so I'll fetch a bigger spanner from my toolbox. The bigger spanner is stronger and stiffer, and better suited for loosening rusted nuts like these. Now we can remove the nut from the other side and lift off the wheel. We'll need to remove this bracket first before we can remove the rear wheel. Our toolkit uses this L-shaped tool for holding sockets, and it includes this adapter for fitting screwdriver bits. They've given us four different screwdriver bits in this handy holder, so I'll go ahead and fit the number two Phillips bit. We'll also need to use the 10mm end of our spanner. I'll use the spanner to turn the nut on the other side of the screw, while I hold the screw head in place with the screwdriver. Because the screw is quite rusty, if I'd tried to crack it loose with the screwdriver, I probably would have just damaged the screw head. Now we can loosen the axle nuts and remove the rear wheel. We will need to push the wheel forward in its slots and pull the chain off the sprocket first. Then the wheel will pull straight out. This chain guard is attached with two screws, which we can easily remove with our screwdriver. That L-shaped handle seemed awkward for a screwdriver at first, but it actually works quite well. Now we can go back to the toolkit and select this giant spanner. We'll use it to loosen this nut on the crankshaft. This nut also needs to be turned in a righty removey direction. Once you've broken it loose, you can finish unscrewing it with your fingers. Next we need to remove the washer. Then I'll use the screwdriver to start turning the inner bearing cone. Once it's loose, you can unscrew this one with your fingers as well. On this bike, the ball bearings are held inside this metal cage. Now we can carefully tilt the crankshaft and remove it from the bottom bracket. This is the matching bearing cage from the other side of the crank. For the next step we'll need a hammer and a metal rod to use as a drift. I'll use this piece of scrap wood between the crank and the concrete. Now I'll brace the crank with my feet while I use the drift to loosen the bearing cone. This part uses a regular lefty loosey thread. As usual, once it's loosened we can finish removing it by hand. Then we can remove the chain ring from the crank as well. Now we'll need the chain breaker from our toolkit. The chain breaker fits onto the chain like this, then we tighten the anvil side against the side of the chain. Now we can turn the handle to force the pin through the chain link. Hmm, that's mighty stiff to turn. Now we can remove the chain breaker from the chain and bend the chain sideways to pop the link apart. Next, we can use our 10mm spanner to unscrew this nut and remove the front brake caliper. Now we can turn the bike upright and fetch the hex keys from our toolkit. We need to loosen this bolt to remove the brake lever from the handlebars. Now we can remove the brake lever and the handlebar grip at the same time. This process can sometimes be a bit difficult. Now I'll remove the other hand grip. 
If you can't remove the hand grip with your fingers, try using your adjustable spanner like this. Now we can loosen the head stem bolt a few turns, then give it a sharp tap with our hammer. That should be enough to allow the handlebars to turn inside the steering tube. Once the handlebars are loose, you should be able to remove them from the steering tube like this. This kind of handlebar mounting is called a quill stem, because this part is supposed to look a bit like the tip of a quill pen. When we tighten the bolt, it pulls the two wedges together and forces them against the inside of the steering tube, like this. Now we can use our big spanner to loosen this nut on the steering tube. I'll need to use the screwdriver and hammer to tap this washer around a little bit before I can remove it. The washer has this little tab on its inner surface, which is supposed to line up with the slot in the steerer tube. Now we can unscrew the bearing cone and remove the fork unit from the head stem. Be careful not to drop the bearing cages on the ground when you do this. Now we can remove the seat post clamp. And if you want to be extra thorough, you can use your hammer and drift to remove the bearing cups from the bottom bracket. Now we can pack away our stock of spare parts into a box. So my plan was now to move on to the green bike, and I did, but unfortunately something went wrong with the chip in the camera and I lost all the footage. So now I'm stuck with this. So please just bear with me for a couple of minutes while I put this bike back together again so I can take it apart on camera. Okay, look, I did make a few shortcuts on that, but it's back together enough for us to show how this one's different from the previous bike and use a few more of the special tools. So let's get into it now. I'll start by removing the gear shifters from the handlebars. For these ones, you just need to loosen this locking screw, then they slide off the end of the handlebars. I'll remove the other shifter in the same way. Now we can disconnect the brake cables from the V-brakes. Just loosen this bolt and the cable will slide out. Because I've already dismantled this bike, the cable end is clean, and we can pull it through the elbow part of the V-brakes as well. Normally these cables will have this little hat crimped onto the cable end to stop it from unravelling. The easiest way to remove the hat is with a sharp pair of clippers. Then the wire cable can be pulled through its guides very easily. Once we've removed the cables, we can unscrew the pivot bolts, then remove the V-brake arms. I'll remove the rear brake parts in the same way. Now we can loosen the brake lever pinch bolts and remove the levers. The brake levers have these slots cut into the housing and into their two tension adjuster nuts. If you line up all three of these slots, you can easily remove the wire cable from the lever. Now we can turn the bike upside down to remove the lower components. The pedals are removed in the same way as with the other bike, and I already used the chain breaker on this chain, so we'll just pop it apart again. Now we can remove the wheels and select the crank puller tool from our toolkit. We'll also need a 14mm socket and since this one is half inch drive we'll use the 10mm hex key and its half inch square adapter to turn it. First we need to remove these plastic dust caps from the cranks. Now we can use the 14mm socket to remove the locking bolt. Some bikes use a socket head bolt for these instead. Now we can screw the crank puller into the crank, screw it in as far as it'll go, then screw in the pin, and turn it with the spanner until the crank pops loose. Now we need to get our lock ring spanner from the toolkit, and use it to loosen this lock ring from the bottom bracket. As usual, once it's loose you can remove it by hand. You might need to use your spanner to loosen the bearing cup, but once it's loose you can unscrew it by hand as well. These bearings are held in a cage, but sometimes they'll just be loose ball bearings that'll drop on the floor and roll away. Now we can carefully remove the crank axle without dropping the other bearing. Next I'll turn the bike around so that we can see the other bearing cup. 
This is the fixed cup and we remove it with our big spanner. It has a left-handed thread so it's another righty removey. Now we can use our 10mm hex key to remove the kickstand. Next I'll use the little adjustable spanner to loosen this bolt, then I'll remove the rear derailleur. Now I'll select the 9mm socket and L key from our toolkit and use them to remove the bolt from the front derailleur. This would have worked for the 9mm bolt on the rear derailleur as well. Now we can flip the bike back upright and remove the seat post and its clamp. Next we'll loosen these two side bolts on the head stem clamp and fully remove the top one. Now the handlebars and their spacer rings should lift right off. Then we can lift up the frame and remove the forks. On the first disassembly of this bike I needed to tap the forks out with a wooden mallet because of this rusty area on the fork tube. Ok, so what to do next? The next two bikes are pretty much the same as what we've already done, so let's just fast forward through them. Although I did break the chain breaker here. Ok, so what tools do we still have to look at? These are tyre levers, which we use to help remove bicycle tyres from their wheel rims. This is a tube patch kit. I'm sure it'll work just fine. This is a tyre pressure gauge. If you press it onto the tyre valve like this, it'll show you the air pressure reading. We didn't use this screwdriver because it's a number one Phillips, and all the screws on the bike were number two Phillips. This is a freewheel remover, and we use it along with this chain whip to remove the sprockets from rear wheels. For a freewheel style wheel like this, we just need the remover tool. That doesn't seem to be fitting properly, maybe the freewheel's rusty. This is a brand new freewheel unit, but our tool still doesn't fit. Let's try this tool from our regular toolkit. OK, that one fits in both, so we'll use it instead. Hold the wheel firmly and turn the freewheel tool with a big spanner in this direction. In this kind of rear wheel, the sprockets and the freewheeling mechanism are all built into one unit. This is a cassette hub style of rear wheel. In this type, the freewheeling mechanism is built into the wheel hub instead of the sprocket pack. You can tell it apart from the freewheel by this flush mounted locking nut. We can use our same freewheel tool to unlock the nut, but we need something to hold the sprocket pack while we turn it. That's where the chain whip comes in. It's best to use a socket handle to hold the freewheel tool for this operation. Once you've loosened the nut, it should unscrew by hand. The smallest couple of sprockets are often in separate parts like this. With the larger sprockets held together in a pack with rivets. As you can see, on this kind of wheel the ratcheting freewheel mechanism is built into the wheel hub. Back to our tool kit, and this is a tool for removing cartridge style bottom brackets. You'll find these on newer bikes, like this one. These are usually screwed in very tightly, so it's best to use a strong socket driver bar and a piece of pipe for extra leverage. The crank bearings are sealed inside this housing, so it's a better choice if you ride your bicycle in very wet and muddy places. This is a spoke key. It's used to loosen and tighten the nipples on the end of the wheel spokes. These are cone spanners. Most bicycle wheel axles are constructed like this, with the bearing cones held at the correct distance apart by these lock nuts. The lock nuts are tightened against the cones, and the thin cone spanner is used to hold the cone in place while the lock nut is installed or removed. This is a pin spanner. It has these two pins fitted at the ends of its movable jaws. I forgot that this was in the toolkit, or I would have used it for loosening the crank bearing cone on that first bike we disassembled. OK, so let's summarise our findings. The only tool out of the whole set that we managed to break was the chain breaker, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. 
I substituted it with this one out of my usual bicycle toolkit, which worked a lot better. Funny thing is they look almost the same, so maybe I'll be able to repair this one in a later video. Now our next thing that didn't work like it should have was the freewheel remover tool. As you saw in the video, I needed to replace it with this one out of my regular toolkit. And finally, this little adjustable spanner, while it's not the worst one I've ever used, it's pretty close. So our next category is things that weren't included in the kit that you will need to be able to do bicycle maintenance. So the first thing in that was the hammer and this drift. Now you've almost certainly got a hammer lying around and this drift was just an old tent peg that I cut the curved end off. Now the next thing you're going to need is a nice long adjustable spanner. This one's 250 millimetres or 10 inches long and it's of a better quality than that one. And finally, you'll need a good pair of cable cutting nippers and a 14 millimetre socket for undoing the lock bolts on those cranks. And finally, in the category of nice to have but not critical, I'd include a stronger bar for your half inch sockets with a piece of pipe to give extra leverage and a 13 and a 15 millimeter socket. Now, while I was hunting around in my collection of old sockets, I also found an 11 and a 12 that can be used with the little socket bar. These aren't really necessary, but again, nice to have. Oh, and one last thing, these hex keys aren't nearly as long as they should be. If they were that long, they'd be far better to use. On balance, if you buy the kit for under $50, I think you'll get your money's worth. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Tightwad Workshop is filmed in front of a live studio audience.